prayer, so I'm so thankful. Um, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this continuation of the Song of Songs. It's just been such a wonderful book for me to be in at this time of my life, and, and I'm just grateful for all of the truths that you've been showing me and that by your grace you are showing so many women. I thank you for the women who I hear from who don't even live here, whom I don't even know, but how you are using um, what we are doing here at Community Bible Church in the lives of women um, from so many different places. And, but Father, I thank you for the women here at Community Bible Church. I thank you for what they mean to me from the youngest all the way up to the oldest and how you have knit our hearts together and that we are running the race with endurance together here at this church. I'm so grateful for that. And um, I pray you be with us today as we continue on in this most wonderful of books. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I called this um, lesson today, and they lived happily ever after. I had to use that phrase at some point. But um, we've reached the concluding chapter in this particular book. We've seen a real man and a real woman, and we're going to see them today as well, the bridegroom and the bride. And this is God's talk to us about love, about dating, about courtship, about marriage, about intimacy in marriage. This is his book, and we followed their love story throughout all of their romance and, and their wedding and the struggles that they had prior to their marriage, then in their marriage, and then some later years in their marriage, and then in their intimacy. And I want to read this chapter, as always, and then we'll look at the verses um, individually. Song of Solomon, chapter 8. Oh, that you were like a brother to me who nursed at my mother's breast. If I found you outdoors, I would kiss you. No one would despise me either. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother, who used to instruct me. I would give you spiced wine to drink from the juice of my pomegranates. Let his left hand be under my head and his right hand embrace me. I want you to swear, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. Who is this coming up from the wilderness leaning on her beloved? Beneath the apple tree I awakened you. There your mother was in labor with you. There she was in labor and gave you birth. Put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as severe as Sheol. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. If a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. We have a little sister, and she has no breast. What shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build on her a battlement of silver. But if she is a door, we will barricade her with planks of cedar." I was a wall and my breasts were like towers. Then I became in his eyes as one who finds peace. Solomon had a vineyard at Bel Hamon. He entrusted the vineyard to caretakers. Each one was to bring a thousand shekels of silver for its fruit. My very own vineyard is at my disposal. The thousand shekels are for you, Solomon, and 200 are for those who take care of its fruit. O oh, you who sit in the gardens, my companions are listening for your voice. Let me hear it. Hurry, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. So the first thing we see, and this is point one on your outline, is what I call her growing desire for intimacy. And I'll read those first two verses again. Oh, that you were like a brother to me who nursed at my mother's breast. If I found you outdoors, I would kiss you. No one would, dis would despise me either. I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother who used to instruct me. I would give you spiced wine to drink from the juice of my pomegranates. Now, Think about it, in those days, public romantic expressions in Israel were frowned upon, even between a husband and a wife. This is why she says to him, oh, that you were like a brother to me. And it's, of course, it's not that she wants him to be her brother. She's just simply expressing to him that she would like to be more expressive no matter who's around. Have you ever felt like that with your husband? <laughs> Have you ever felt like, you know, you're in public, but you kind of wish you were alone? And this is where maybe you would make eye contact 
eye contact with your husband, like for later or something like that. But like you and me, she learned how to control her passions, and it's called self-control. And even though we don't see that much in our day anymore, it is a virtue to have restraint and self-control. And, and the thing is, is she learned this from her mother. And that's interesting, it's profound really. Her mother gave her talks, her mother taught her well about passion. Did your mother do this? Mine did. And are you talking to your daughters? She remembers her mother's instructions. Verse two said, I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother who used to instruct me. Now mothers are supposed to be instructing their daughters and they're supposed to be instructing their daughters not just about personal hygiene, not just about cleaning up their rooms, not just about cooking, not just about doing their lessons, not just all these things. They're supposed to be instructing their daughters in this area of their lives. And we can't do this if we're not with them, if we don't spend time with them, if we're not getting to know them. And we can't do it either in, in the truest sense or in the most expressive sense if we're not living out the word of God in our own lives. I love what Proverbs 6 says. My son, observe the commandment of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk to you. For the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is light and reproofs are for, the, for discipline are the way of life. Now, the reason I love this so much is because God is just assuming that parents are instructing their children. And that instruction is what they draw from when they are grown. And you're no longer their authority, or they no longer live under your roof, or you're gone. And they still remember the things that you said to them. It, you know, mama always said this, or I remember one time when mama said this, or daddy told me this. I remember sitting at the kitchen table and he said this to me. And as women, we need to be instructing our daughters in this whole area of passion. And the Shulamite here has not forgotten her mama's wise and wholesome talks, her upbringing, the way she was raised. And this is why she likes to take her husband back to her old home where she has her roots. Parents still have the obligation to train their children in this whole relationship and dating things thing. So moms, if we're wise, we will be doing this and we should be doing this and we should be wise. You've lived through the teenage years. You remember, don't you, what that was like? You know what it was like. And we all know what it's like to be angry with our parents because they're trying to put walls and fences around us. For example, I remember one time when I was in college, in fact, I was a junior, and I was very involved in the ministry of Campus Crusade for, Crusade for Christ. I was very involved in it. I was very committed to the Lord. And I came home one weekend, and I was fully intending to spend a lot of time with my then boyfriend, and he was also a strong believer. We just went to separate colleges after high school. So we would sometimes plan to go home on the same weekend so we could do stuff together. What happened to be when I came home that weekend, my parents told me what they were leaving. I probably had not said, oh, I'm coming home this weekend, but they were going, they were going away for the weekend. And then they just decided when I came home, you're going with us. Because I would be home by myself if I didn't go with them. And I said, I don't want to go. I, I've already made plans with my boyfriend. And I begged with them and I pleaded with them. And I wanted so badly to say, Mom and Daddy, I'm 20 years old. I'm at college. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm away. I can do whatever I want when I'm away. And I don't because I love Christ. You know, I wanted to say a whole bunch of things. But I didn't because I had grown enough in my relationship with the Lord to know that I needed to submit to my parents, to their authority. And my mother kept saying, well, we just don't want you to be home by yourself. I know in hindsight now what she meant by that. So I went with my parents. I knew I had to submit to the Lord, but I've often thought about that. I've thought about it 
so many times in my life wondering if that was the Lord putting up a wall around me, just keeping me safe that weekend. And that's our job as parents to keep our children safe as much as we can. We all know that they can rebel and and walk out the door. But our job is to make it hard for them to do that. Our job is so that even if they do that, they know mom and daddy tried to keep me from doing that and they put up so many walls and fences and it's my fault if I kick down that wall and kick down that fence. You know, and I think about this too when we were raising our children and my son Jordan is married to Maureen and they started what we always say, talking when they were 15. And I know that Carl and I were annoying hawks when they were talking. I mean, I know we were as we guarded, as we put up fences and as we put up walls. And the only way they could be together is if our families were together, they couldn't talk on the phone unless the door was open and anybody could go in and out of that room. Or we would say, yeah, you can go to lunch, but you know, Jameson's going with you. That's the kind of stuff we did. Maybe we were over the top, I don't know. But that's what we did. And we told our son that he needed to treat her like she was his sister. And those parameters that we were putting up had nothing to do with not trusting them because I'm gonna tell you, they are godly teenagers, godly teens. It was just us trying to put those walls and fences up. And I remember one time when a member of our church told us, and he hadn't been here all that long, but he had gotten to know our family a little bit, gotten to know them, and he thought Maureen was Jordan's sister, and I remember like, yes, yes, that's what it's supposed to be like. It was such a compliment to me, and they, and to them, and they conducted themselves with so much integrity, and here's the thing. A 15-year-old can be very godly and very mature, or a 16-year-old, but they are only as mature as a 15-year-old and a 16-year-old can be, even though sometimes it seems like they are so wise beyond their years, and that's true. Mine did seem that way. Those two did seem that way, but we are supposed to put up fences and walls. Our children, and, and if our children break trust, or if someone tries to get in to break the trust, and now there's all kinds of ways for them to get in that we don't even know. It's like, I didn't even know they were into this. I mean, I just spoke to a a mom recently who lives in another um, city in this state, and she was saying how somebody got into her daughter through something, she's called it something, I don't even remember what it was called. She said, I didn't even know that existed. And was getting, was grooming her daughter. But, It's so dangerous these days. You gotta be on top of it. Because even the godliest of teenagers will say and do things in their immaturity that they will regret later. And that's just part of our job to help them with that. And if the fences aren't high enough, we gotta build the fences even higher. And will they like the fences? No. But they'll thank you later. And if they don't thank you later, then something's going on with them. I didn't like the fences that my mother and father put around me, but I see the wisdom now and I'm grateful for it. So just be wise in this area, moms. You know, give your teenagers supervision. Be there. Let them have teens in your home if that's what they want to do. Don't be the parents who just leave the group and let them do whatever because you want to be cool. Be the uncool parent if that's what it takes to protect your teens and other people's teens from something that they may thank you for later. The bride continues, verse three, let his left hand be under my head and his right hand embrace me. She's thinking, anticipating the next time they'll be together. She's thinking about this, their intimacy, what God, and God has done this in her life. And her thoughts here are right and good. It's okay. It's very different from thoughts that might come to your mind concerning some other man that's sinful. Or thoughts even that she may have had before she was married to him. But she adds here in verse four, I want you to swear, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not arouse or awaken my love until she pleases. After you're married and after you've begun to experience intimacy, and I believe this is true for the Shulamite, 
the, she was experiencing these things the way God intended for her to experience them, she became even more convinced that the love should not be aroused or awakened in immoral ways. Before she was married, she had to be careful that her love was not awakened prematurely. Remember, she put some of her own safeguards in place. And even, this, if the, even with this man whom she was going to marry, she wasn't of the mindset, well, we're going to be married, so it's okay. Because that's what a lot of people think. Well, we're getting married, we're engaged, so it's okay. After marriage, marriage then, it kind of shifts. A woman has to be on guard against advances from men who don't really care if you're married. And they're everywhere. Unprincipled men are everywhere. And they will hit on you everywhere. But listen, when you have the best or you're waiting for the best, if you're convinced that God has the best for you, whether it's being single or whether it's married, whatever it is, because God's ways are best, your convictions will run deep. Get your convictions settled because then if, you have, if your convictions run deep, you're not swayed by the culture. It's like you have an anchor that holds you steady. So when the culture shifts, you don't shift with it because your anchor is steady. It's in the word of God and your convictions run deep. And now it's like a narrator speaks in verse five. Who is this coming up from the wilderness leaning on her beloved? Now this question sets the scene for what's going to follow. This couple... They're walking and talking, and as they're doing this, she's leaning on him. It's a beautiful picture of being one with her husband. They're coming up from the wilderness, the desert. And in the Old Testament, the wilderness is often pictured as, I mean, it's associated with, not just picture, but it's associated with that um, 40 year period of wandering of Israel in the wilderness. And in this couple's relationship, she had a period of wandering. We've seen that. Yet now she's leaning on him, coming up from the desert times that they've had in their lives. And they overcame those desert times. And they overcame other, uh, so many times like that. Remember her insecurity, just to name one of them? Her concern, too, about the little foxes that could ruin their relationship when she talked about it before they were married and then she talked about later after they're married. And even her indifference toward him all things that this couple had to work through. And so the wilderness is symbolic of the fact that there had been some times in their marriage of disunity, but they overcame those. They didn't want those to do them in, they wanted to overcome them. And all couples, even the best of couples, the most godliest of couples, couples who are committed to each other for life, have wilderness times. That's just part of life. It's not like, oh no, we're, you know, this is terrible right now. Well, it might be terrible right now, but you work through it. You get through it. And so the question becomes, it's not whether or not you're going to have a wilderness time with your spouse. It's whether or not you're, you're going to be committed to coming out of that wilderness time and being stronger because of it. The stress that came into your marriage made you stronger because you responded to it correctly. So do you, as a wife, if you're married, want to come out of a wilderness time that you might be walking through? And maybe some of you are walking through it right now. Do you want to come out of it so that you can walk up from the wilderness leaning on your beloved, leaning on your husband? Then point two on your outline, she remembers an earlier time when she says this, beneath the apple tree I awakened you. There your mother was in labor with you. There she was in labor and gave you birth. She's remembering when a time early in their dating and their courting, she's thinking about it and she's expressing how glad she was that he was born, that his mother gave birth to him. Because think about it, I think we talked about it a little bit last time, but here is her husband who is the expression, he's the physical expression of his parents' physical love. 
You know that song, that old song by the Carpenters, on the day that you were born, the angels got together and decided to, y'all are singing it in your head, I know, <laughs> and decided to create a dream come true. So they sprinkled moon dust in, in your hair of gold and starlight in your eyes of blue. That's why all the girls in town follow you all around. Just like me, they long to be close to you. And then, you know, the part that says, that's why birds suddenly appear every time you're near. Just like me, they long to be close to you. Of course, the lyrics of that song are stupid because they're not even true. Angels don't create anything. God creates. And what she's expressing here is she's so thankful, she's so grateful that his mother gave him birth. You ever thank God that your husband was born? That his mother gave him life? You ever wonder what your life would be like without your husband if you're married? I mean, sometimes I reflect on my life and I think about how God brought my husband to me or how God brought me to my husband. I think about how different our backgrounds are, how different we grew up. And sometimes I'm really amazed that God in his providence moved the chess pieces to bring us together. I mean, I grew up in the Carolinas I did not even know a northerner until I went to college. I didn't even know anyone who was raised Catholic, not one person. I had never been anywhere other than the Southeast except one time when we went to see my dad's sister and they were living in Illinois and I was eight years old. But God has his ways of doing things And of course, he had to bring Carl South because I wasn't going to go up there. (laughs) But I think about how, I mean, I think about this, and I've thought about a lot as I've been walking through this book, but how God saved Carl when he was a freshman at Boston College. I didn't know him then. I didn't know anything about him. And then I got involved in the ministry of Campus Crusade at my college, Carl was saved through the ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ, which, by the way, used to be really good. He was saved through that ministry as a freshman. Then he grew like crazy as he was at Boston College. And then when he graduated, instead of being an accountant, he wanted to go on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ, and he did. And they placed him at UNC. And the first time I heard him talk, I couldn't even understand him and... and, and my friends and I all laughed at him, not laughing at him, but laughing at his voice and his accent. I think about that sometimes. Only God could do something like that because sometimes I think, why in the world did Crusade put him at a southern campus? But, you know, I was a student we, and I was, thought I was going to marry somebody else at the time when I met Carl. But the more I got to know him, the more God worked, the more I saw him preach the gospel. I become a Christian when I was a little girl. He became a Christian at 18 and he was way ahead of me. Walked and talked, got to know each other and then I said yes my senior year when he proposed. Do you ever walk down memory lane? Do you ever walk, take a stroll about Your husband, ever think about the way you were when you first fell in love with him? And I know for some of you, because I I just know this, you began in all the wrong ways. Maybe you're on your second or third or fourth marriage. I don't know. Perhaps you were the other woman. Perhaps your marriage was begun because of adultery. I don't know. And if that's the case, though, what we do with that is you just repent You confess it to the Lord who is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You take responsibility for whatever part, if you, for your own sin. That's how you move forward. And you have to do that so you can teach God's principles to your children and them not to think you're just a hypocrite. You tell them what the scriptures says. You know, you just admit your part. You deal with it honestly before the Lord. Only then can you really move forward the way God wants you to. And for others of you, maybe your marriage began 
perfectly. Yet the years have brought all kinds of, you know, disillusionment. Or you're just tired of him. Or you've started taking him for granted. Or maybe the two of you have just become nitpickers of each other. Take a stroll down memory lane. Relive that first attraction when you were so in love. And then you will say, like the Shulamite in verse 6, put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. I just love that. In the Old Testament times, a seal was used to show ownership of someone's most valuable treasures, what was most important to them. And she wants her husband's seal over her heart and over his heart. She wants everyone to know that she is his treasure, his most valued possession. Because whether your husband knows it or not, you are his most valuable possession. You are. And you want to pray that God shows him that. <laughs> But so much so, this is her desire that she wants to be in his heart, over his heart, and in his thoughts, on his mind. Not that she's a distraction to him, that's not what she's asking for, but that she is a part of him, like the woman described in Proverbs. Proverbs 12, verse 4 says this, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband. And then, of course, he gives us the contrast. But she who shames him is like rottenness in his bones. Remember, Eve was made from Adam's bone, from her rib. So when you shame him, you're rottenness in his bones. But if you're an excellent wife, you're his crown. Proverbs 31, it, it just fits with this, verses 10 to 12. An excellent wife who can find for her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. He doesn't have to worry about her. Gossiping about him, putting him down. She protects him because her desire is to do him good, to be such a part of him that she is an influence both in his heart and in his mind and in his actions. She wants to be completely identified with him. Oneness in heart, the kind of oneness where it's difficult to tell where one ends and the other begins. And in those days, too, that ownership seal could be seen by anyone. It could be seen by everyone. So what's she saying here? She wants her loyalty to him not only obvious to him as her husband, but she wants that loyalty to be obvious to everyone who knows them. She's saying she wants to be totally owned by him, and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing if it's biblical in a good way. Because no way can any other man get to her. No way can any other man steal her heart or steal her affections. And like I said earlier, there are plenty of men who want to do that because they don't care. He knows she stands with him. He is certain of her loyalty. He knows she belongs to him. And, and by the way, this should be true of men too, to be totally owned by their wives in the sense that their loyalty to them. 2 Timothy 2 verse 19 says this, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. There's that word again, this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. So just think about that for a second. Do you want to be owned by the Lord? Do you want to be so identified with him that everyone knows you belong to him? You're not ashamed of him. You belong to the Lord. We're supposed to have that kind of loyalty to Christ. We are. And that's why when he continues in that verse, everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wickedness. That's what sets us apart because of our loyalty to Christ. And he knows those who are his. So the question becomes, are we ashamed of him? Are we ashamed to be identified with him as a Christian? Do we really want him to put his seal over our hearts to be identified with him even when people mock him? and make fun of him and make fun of his followers 
And the mocking in our day is increasing and it's going to continue. It's not going to ease up, y'all. It's going to get more fierce. You know, and it's, it's just, and you gotta prepare your children for this too. You've got to prepare your children that if they walk with Christ, if they're identified with him, they will be mocked. It will come in some way, shape, or form. Because the only thing that's not mocked is everything outside of Christianity. We have to help our children with this. You know, mocking comes in public schools where a Christian student chooses to be identified with the Lord and opts out of maybe some of the indoctrination classes. I know that's not what they're called, but that's what they are. Or even in Christian schools where a student who is serious about his or her faith doesn't participate in the party crowd because there are plenty of party crowds in the Christian schools. Or, or homeschooled students are, who are mocked because they're homeschooled. You know, as believers, we need to keep ourselves clean and pure and kind before a watching world so that when we are persecuted, when, not if, when, it's because of our godliness and our identification with Christ, not because we're obnoxious. You know, and I really didn't, you know, anticipate, you know, when I was at home educating my kids, I didn't really think about that one day when they went to universities that they could be mocked for that or made fun of for that. I did not anticipate that. But then I realized at some point that it was happening some, and I remember one, <laughs> even though my, one of my sons, he would always say, I, I, when I would hear them you know, make fun of homeschoolers, I would just wait. I wouldn't say anything. They wouldn't, didn't know that I was homeschooled. And then I'd let them say everything they wanted to say, mocking homeschoolers, and I'd say, I was homeschooled. He loved to do that. <laughs> and then there would be this awkward silence. And, and then they would say, well, you're the exception. <laughs> he would say, no. But there's weirdos everywhere, by the way. It doesn't matter if they're home. There's plenty of weirdo homeschoolers. I get that. There's plenty of weirdo public schoolers. I get that. There's plenty of weirdo Christian school kids. It's not about being a weirdo or not, but one, one group being a weirdo. It's just there's just weirdos in the world, <laughs> no matter where they are. But I do remember telling my kids when I realized it, don't be ashamed of your godly home and that you were, and they weren't, so don't misunderstand me, but we just reinforce it. Your godly upbringing. Because most kids today don't have it. I wouldn't say, don't be ashamed of your heritage. I think about that for myself. I was just born in a little, little rural farm. And I'm proud of my heritage. Because if you believe in God's sovereignty, you know that he causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. But, but I would say that to them. Sometimes they're mocking, whether it's your Christianity or whatever it is, is because they don't have it. They didn't maybe have parents who cared about them or who put walls and fences around them. And so if your students have a good home life, if it's a protected home life, even if they don't like it now, they will. They will one day realize that so many do not have it. So many have no home life, no place to go. Or their home is filled with turmoil and, turmoil and strife. Y'all don't let your homes be filled with turmoil and strife. You know, that's what the enemy of your soul wants. He wants your home to be wrapped with that kind of stuff because he wants your witness to be ineffective even with your children. He can't unsave you, but he'll certainly attack you to, to make you live as if you don't know the Lord. That's why you, you got to go against him. You got to remember that he's a roaring lion seeking someone to devour or he's very crafty and he's snooping around, lying to you. Y'all, this is our time, it's our opportunity. Then she continues in chapter eight when she says, put me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. Now, think about that for a second. I immediately thought of three things that symbolize this seal in our day. The engagement ring, I have mine on. The wedding ring, I have mine on. A woman taking her husband's last name. And a lot of people today don't think that's important anymore to take their husband's last name, but y'all, it's important. 
you're identified with your husband. It's like saying, I'm his. I belong to him. I'm not free to belong to anyone else. I'm no longer just Audrey Hill McKay. I've added a new name. I'm now Audrey Hill McKay Brogy. I haven't ceased being my mom and daddy's daughter, but I'm now Carl Brogy's wife, and I belong to him. And the Shulamite then explains why she feels this way. She says, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as severe as Sheol. That's the place of the dead. It flash, its flashes are flashes of fire. The very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. If a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised for love is as strong as death. She's saying here that real love, the kind that God gives and grows in a marriage is as strong as death. That's point three on your outline, by the way. But how? You can't stop death. Think about it. You cannot stop it. Now, we all want to stop it or prolong, you know, prolong our lives so that it doesn't come as soon as it might, we think it could. But we can't stop it. It will come. It will overpower you. It will overtake you. It will conquer you eventually. And this is how powerful God's kind of love is. And here's the thing. The more you grow in your relationship with the Lord, the more you love him, it just naturally flows that the love for your husband will grow. Y'all, that's true. If that's not happening, then something's wrong in your relationship with God. Think about that, ladies. You can say all day long how spiritual you are and how much you loved God. But if you are treating your husband like dirt and not loving him, if you loathe him, if you resent him, you are only fooling yourself. You are not fooling the Lord. And in that, you're calling God a liar. Because the irony is this, God actually calls you a liar. First John 1, verse six, and, verses 6 and 7. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and he's talking to the believers here, people who are saved. If we say that we're in fellowship with him, that we have fellowship with him, we're in a relationship if we've come to know him, and that is permanent. But our fellowship changes with sin. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in, dark, in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And then in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 6, by this we know we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Y'all, that just proves we know him. We don't earn our acceptance before him by keeping his commandments, but if we know him, our heart's desire is to keep his commandments. The one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Now let's think about this for a minute, especially in relationship to our husbands. God commands us to love them. In fact, it's one of the things that the older women are told to be constantly teaching and encouraging and training the young women to do because it's assumed that they've learned enough that they know how to love their husbands because love is a choice, it's a commitment. So if a woman has truly come to know the, Jesus Christ, she will keep his commandments and one of them is to love her husband. And of course, another one is to respect him. So if she says, well, I've come to know the Lord, I'm a believer, but she doesn't keep the command of loving her husband, and you could add respecting her husband, then she is the liar, and the truth is not in her. Because see, the love of Christ constrains us to love other people, yes, but that lo loving other people, the first one is our own husbands. And how many of us are so very quick to do for others, but not for our own husbands? 
First John chapter 3 continues. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. So that's a mark of being a believer that you love other believers. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Now think about that. He's talking about the brethren. What about your husband? Is he one of your brethren? Have you ever seen your husband in need? I mean, it could be in any way, but I'll just say maybe physically. And you closed your heart against him? But God is saying here that if that's the case, if you're a believer and you're closing your heart against your brother or your sister in Christ, or, and then when I say your brother here, I'm talking about specifically for those of you who are married, your husbands. How does the love of God abide in you? I mean, that's what God is asking us. He's, I mean, that's, that's what he says at verse 18. says, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. That's what proves what we say. Our deeds show if we really believe what we say. Because true love expresses itself in action. And I do think sometimes that the greatest challenge to us as believing women is not what we do for others out there, because we're good at taking meals to people. We're good at sending notes of encouragement. We're so good sometimes at buying a little gift and show, you know, for someone. We're so good at so many things like that. And we should be as God leads. That's a good thing, not discounting that in the least bit. But I believe our greatest challenge is in doing those very same things for our own husbands to him first, making sure about his meals. Now, if he doesn't care that you make his meals, that's fine. Some husbands just like to fend for themselves, that's fine. But if he cares, that's one of the ways, not only do you show him that you love him, but you are expressing your love for the Lord. That's not nothing. You know, rolling out bread dough and watching it rise because you know your husband really enjoys that fresh baked bread out of the oven if that's what you do. I mean, people like different things, so it's not about bread dough. But doing those things for him, sending him a little note of encouragement, everything, he might be discouraged and he just doesn't tell you because you talk all the time. Or buying maybe a, something for him that you know he's like just needed and he just hasn't gotten it. You're married to him. He's your first priority. And by the way, for those of you who are not married, who may be teenagers listening to this, start putting these things in practice. Do it for your mom. Do it for your dad. You ever think your mom and dad could be discouraged and just need you to come up and give them a hug and say, Mom, I just appreciate what you do for me. Show it to your siblings. Because so often, you know, you're growing up in a home and it's like you're always fighting with your siblings. But it's like, do for them. Start practicing these things and do it because you love them. But more than because you love them, because you love the Lord. Again, 1 first, first John 3. Well, it's, not, it's just a continuation here. Verse 23, this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. Just as he commanded us, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. See, God's love is as strong as death. Both are controlling. 2 Corinthians 5 says, For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. Love is as universal and irresistible as death. No one can stop death from coming and no one can escape death. This is how powerful love is. And she continues, jealousy is as severe as Sheol. She's not talking about the ungodly sinful jealousy here. She's talking about the kind that, she's not talking about the kind that covets what other ha others have, the kind that leads to envy and strife and hate. She's referring to God's kind of jealousy. True love, real love is jealous. It's exclusive, it's possessive, it's as severe as Sheol. 
It's as severe as the place of the dead, the grave. True love has a jealousy about it that is a reflection of the jealousy of God. Listen to these, this verse from, from Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water underneath the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those, generations of those who hate me. He says he's a jealous God. He says that. He doesn't want them to make, make covenants with the inhabitants of the land when he continues in, in Exodus chapter 34. He doesn't want them sacrificing to idols. He doesn't want them worshiping other gods. He's jealous for them. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2 says this, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband that so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I'm afraid lest as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. I mean, think about that. So husbands and wives have every right to be jealous when somebody's showing affection to someone else. Or when some woman out there is getting in your space with your husband a little too close. If you're married, you belong to your husband. He wants you to be faithful to him. He is jealous for you. You're his bride, his woman. And if you know Jesus Christ as your savior, then you belong to him. You, he paid a high price for you. And he wants you to be faithful to him. He doesn't want you playing the harlot with the world. He's jealous for you. You're his bride. And just as the faithful husband does not want you to flirt with other men, God doesn't want you to flirt with other men. And he doesn't want you to flirt with the world either. Our God is a jealous God. He wants us to worship no one else. Our devotion belongs to him. And he's expressed this covenantal love for his people. And if you know him, you're one of them. And, he, and, and so she says, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as severe as Sheol. It's flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. I mean, think about those words. I mean, those are passionate words, like a blazing fire, very flame of the Lord. And of course, you know that the world wants to give you a cheap substitute for how, I mean, and how it portrays passion. And a lot of people have settled for it. They just want a new experience. And rather than trusting God for the experience that he's already provided, y'all, this is God's word. He's the one who's describing his love like this. I mean, you could make it, just make a list. In fact, I did it in my notes. Strong as death, jealous, severe as the grave, flashes of fire, passionate, the very flame of the Lord. You understand what this means, y'all? Real true love has its source in God. God is love. This kind of love is supernatural. That's why it's further defined in verse 7. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. If a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. The picture here is the strength of water. Think about that. Think about a hurricane. Think about the most powerful tsunami. Think about how water is so strong. It's the kind of water, that kind of water, the power there cannot be contained. That's why you have all these signs like, don't try to cross a, a road that's overflowing with water because you'll be swept away with it. It's so powerful. But that kind of love is sourced in God. He is love and he possesses all power. And that's why Romans, Paul could say in Romans chapter eight, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But then he goes on and he says, nothing can separate us. He says, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God's love, y'all. And now your husband may have stopped loving you. Your boyfriend may have stopped loving you. Maybe your parents have abandoned you. Maybe your children have rejected you, but not God. 
His kind of love cannot be overpowered. Nothing you can do can ever make him stop loving you. Nothing. And then the song continues, if a man were to give all the riches of his house for love, it would be utterly despised. The final statement about the love in the song is that it is priceless. Money can't buy it. If you can't buy it, how do you get it? Real love, true love is always given. It is a gift. God freely gives his love to us. He freely does it. And the bride knew that kind of love. And the final verse of the book explains how she received this love. And that brings us to point four on your outline, her brother's protection. Verse eight, we have a little sister and she has no breast. <clears throat> what shall we do for our sister on the day when she is spoken for? Now this girl, what we're seeing here, she grew up in a home filled with older brothers who cared for her. These brothers served as her protectors. We don't know anything about her father. Maybe he died and the brothers were filling in for his role in their sister's life. They stepped up to the plate and wanted to make sure she married the right man and they wanted to prepare her for marriage. This is a picture of a protective family and how the men of that family wanted to protect their sister. And it's really a picture of what a father's role should be from a little girl's earliest years before she has matured, she has no breast. Her fa a father and older brothers as their dad tra has trained them that we're seeing maybe here is to protect her. He's to train her, encourage her to keep her body pure only to be given to the man who's willing to make that commitment of marriage and provision for her. Don't you think there would be a lot less girls living with their boyfriends if they had grown up in a home where the father loved them the way God intended and told them these things because then they would see right through it he, he he doesn't want he doesn't want to make a commitment so why should I give him the benefits of a marriage we don't seem to have this kind of picture anymore I mean we have even so-called Christian fathers who allow boyfriends to move in the home with the family <laughs> or a girlfriend to move in the home with the boyfriend's family y'all it's like we're so blind. We have Christian fathers who allow their daughters to dress inappropriately, sometimes because mama steps in and usurps his authority. But I don't know. I mean, we, we just see it. But this was a healthy family of men who want to protect their sister from unprincipled men. Listen to what they said. If she is a wall, we will build on her a battlement of silver. What they're saying here is that if she responded to their protection and counsel and authority, that's what they mean by if she is a wall, if they see her good character emerging, if they see her becoming what she should be, exercising good judgment and resisting temptation, that they will give her more freedom. They'll build on her battlement of silver. They will adorn her at the proper time because you know, um, as you mature, you get more responsibility. You get, I mean, you get more freedom as you show responsibility. And then, but they also say, but if she is a door, meaning if they notice foolishness in her life and maybe sensuality emerging in their sister, if they see her wanting to allow any man to come through before God's timing, if she's listening to flattery, then they said, we will barricade her with planks of cedar. They planned to restrict her freedom. They had to. They would have to. And y'all, this is good parenting. You know, we should become students of our children. We watch them. It's our job. If we see sensuality emerging in our daughters, we need to barricade them with planks of cedar. Responsibility, again, goes hand in hand with freedom. We don't need to give our children so much freedom if they have no responsibility and they're not exercising responsibility. No goals, no calling in life, just hanging out all the time. And that brings us to the last words recorded in this book. That's point five. Verse 10 shows how she responded to her brothers. Verse 10, I was a wall and my breasts were like towers. Then I became in his eyes as one who finds peace. The beloved's own testimony is that she was pure. She listened to her brothers. She said, I was a wall. She didn't have to be barricaded. When her breasts became like towers, meaning that she grew and she was physically developed, she kept herself pure. 
and the right kind of man was attracted to her. In his eyes, she found peace. That's what she's saying. A girl who keeps herself pure doesn't have regrets. She doesn't have to worry about getting pregnant as a single person. She doesn't have to worry about sexually transmitted diseases. She doesn't have to worry about all these comparisons. She doesn't have secrets to hide. She doesn't have guilt. She doesn't have shame. She has freedom in her heart. She has peace. That's what she's saying here. Verse 11, Solomon had a vineyard at Belhaman. He entrusted the vineyard to care. It was to bring a thousand shekels of silver for its fruit. Now these two, two verses give us a glimpse of how Solomon and the Shulamite met. It, they met in a vineyard. That's what it seems to be telling us. And it was probably one that her brothers rented and probably the same one where they made her work. Remember chapter one when she said, don't stare at me because I'm swarthy. The sons burned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me caretaker of the vineyards. But I have not taken care of my own vineyard. Remember back then when she said that? Remember, she was this hardworking girl who submitted to her brother's authority. And isn't it interesting, but as she was doing what she was supposed to be doing, working hard under authority, Solomon found her and fell in love with her. Now, who does that make you think of, another young woman in the Bible? I mean, it makes you think of Ruth. That's exactly what happened to Ruth when she was a widow and she went back with Naomi. Remember how the, all the husbands were taken? And then she goes, and her, and her goal in life at that point was to take care of her mother-in-law. Her mother-in-law, not even her mother, but her mother-in-law. And she's gleaning in the fields, working hard. And she's in the portion of the field that belongs to this man named Boaz. And Boaz notices her. He, she, you remember why he asked the, the reapers, like, whose young woman is that? I mean, she's not out there trying, looking for him. She's working. And so, you know, and how does a woman look when she's working hard? Dirty, sweaty, I don't know. But Boaz noticed her, Solomon noticed the Shulamite. You know, Shulamite working hard in that vineyard, same thing. Solomon notice, notices her. Now at this point in her life, all these years later, she remembers. She knows that it wasn't just about the actual vineyard to not only that, but it was about her vineyard. When she was a young woman, she was concerned about her body, remember? And how she hadn't taken care of it because she had to work. Now she says this. Notice how she's grown and matured. Verse 12. My very own vineyard is at my disposal. The thousand shekels are for you, Solomon, and 200 are for those who take care of its fruit. What she's saying here is that she freely gave her own vineyard, her own body to her husband. And all that she has, all her possessions too, she wasn't for sale. Her vineyard and all her, her possessions were freely given to him. And then he then speaks to her. Oh, you who sit in the gardens, my companions are listening for your voice. Let me hear it. I mean, these two are more passionate, than, passionate now than they've ever been. Their love has grown in its intensity. He loves her voice. He loves listening to her. Remember chapter 2 when he said this, Oh, my dove in the clefts of the rock, in the secret place of this deep pathway, let me see your form, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your form is lovely. And now all these years later, she's no dripping faucet. Maybe she was from different wilderness times in their marriage, but she's not now. He wants to hear her. He desires time with her. And again, I'll ask you again, like I asked you way back, does your husband like to hear you talk? Is your voice sweet to him? She responds, verse 14, hurry my beloved and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. Back when they were dating, she so longed to be his bride. Now in their marriage, she loved being his wife. She wanted, she wants him now to be in no hurry. I mean, she wants him now to hurry, to come get her. They look forward to intimacy. I mean, she's looking forward to it. This is a sign of a healthy marriage. She's looking forward to being with her husband, even in these maturing years of their marriage. It's like she's saying, I know him, I'm his bride, I belong to him. She's still in love with him. And this is the way it should be, not only for married couples with you and your husband, but this is the way it should be with you and your Lord. 
if you know him, if you belong to him, if his seal is over your heart, then you have intimacy with him right now. But in a healthy relationship with Christ, you will always desire for more intimacy with him. You'll want to know him more and better and deeper. You'll want to grow and mature in your relationship with him. And see, the Song of Songs is a beautiful picture of the way a love relationship is supposed to be between a husband and wife. And lived his way, we can experience this. But more than this beautiful picture of the way the love relationship is supposed to be between a husband and a wife, it's a representation of what God wants between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we come together next week, we're going to jump through the whole book in one session, looking at it from that perspective the next time, next week, when we conclude this whole series on the Song of Songs. Father, I thank you for, once again, for this message, for the truths of your word. I thank you for the kind attention of these women. I thank you for this book and all that it has meant to me as I've walked through it, thinking about, reflecting on my own marriage and even times in my life of training and teaching my children and, and then thinking of the women who will hear this and by your grace will apply it and some maybe who don't even know you but will find you, that you as you woo them and bring them into a right relationship with yourself. Father, we, I pray that with all my heart that you would use this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, ladies.